Hey there guys, Pastor Gary here at Calvary Chapel in uh, Gloucester County, and uh, it's good to be able to come to you again. Uh, again, just I keep saying it because I really believe it and I mean it. I can't wait till we fill up this place and um, <coughs> we get back together again. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'm hearing some interesting things about coronavirus. I, I tend to be, be one of those people who subscribe to the theory that there's probably a lot more people that have had it uh, they're finding that to be true more and more, which is good. It builds up the antibodies, and uh, that's a good thing for us. And hopefully, as we hear more and more of the terminology like herd immunity, I think that's a great thing. And um, I think we need to build up immunities to these things. This is what we've done to other viruses and, and those types of things. I don't subscribe that we have to have repeat performances year after year after year or anything like that. So I trust in the Lord. Uh, I trust in the fact that he is... He has created us and, and he makes us, uh, he makes us, um, or he gives us everything we need uh, in these bodies. Now, look, are people sick and, and dying? Absolutely. Uh, I don't, of course, wish that on anybody. And uh, we need to practice safe things and, and we need to make sure we're doing what we need to do. But on top of that, just let's start trusting in the Lord. Let's start believing what he tells us. And that's kind of got me thinking today. Um, you know, we finished up. Um, Ephesians chapter 6 and talking about the armor of God and and I, I hope you're keeping up with all these things and uh, as we go through them and this is kind of like an addendum to that I think uh, in sort of a weird kind of way of this idea of the armor of God because as I was thinking of armor I was thinking of military and as I think of military I think of some thoughts you know I was reading an article by uh, Dr. Tony Evans you know uh, a, you know great preacher and um, in, the art, in his article, he was talking a little bit about the, uh, the coronavirus. And, uh, and I, I was intrigued by something he said. He said that, you know, a virus um, spreads. And, and he's right. But, you know, fear spreads also. And we've got to be really careful about not being those people who are causing fear. Um, in the ancient battlefields, uh, the Romans, the, the Greeks, um, the Persians, all the mighty empires, you know. One of the things that they used to be fearful of on a battlefield was just that. The generals, the leaders were fearful that if panic set in, that it would spread. And the next thing you know, you have a retreating army or you have a decimated army uh, because <coughs> they allowed panic to get involved. They allowed fear to get involved. Try not to look at everything through panic and fear. And it reminded me of a trip, uh, one of the trips we've taken to Israel. And uh, as we went to Israel, we always go, because it's one of my favorite spots actually, is a place called Caesarea Philippi. And I love Caesarea Philippi. It's just an interesting place to me. And there's a lot of neat spiritual things that go on there. And um, as you travel up there, you'll notice uh, as we leave the Galilean see the northern part, Capernaum and that region, we travel about 25 miles north to this area uh, called Caesarea Philippi. Uh, now it wasn't always called Caesarea Philippi and in fact there was uh, it, at one point it was called Benias uh, and then there was a Panias or Panias uh, is what it was called uh, by the Greeks. Uh, the Arab culture that day they they don't have the letter P and so they called it Benias but also in the past, it was because of Baal worship, Baal worship is what was going on up there. Well, in the Old Testament period, if you remember when the kingdom split, Jeroboam goes to the northern kingdom. And up in that northern kingdom, you have, you have uh, worship influences that started coming in. When they left the southern and they headed north, they were still, it was still temple worship. But by the time they got up there, Jeroboam started uh, a false temple worship. And on top of that, then the influences from all the other Canaanite and other people started influencing them, and they fell into paganism. In fact, it tells us that Jeroboam put up high places, is what he did, where pagan worship would happen. Well, if you go a little further north from the Galilean region, go from the Old Testament of Baal worship and under Jeroboam's influence, you'll go up there and you'll find out that up in that northern, northern part, 25 miles north, uh, up in Caesarea Philippi, they started worshiping, uh, they had Baal worship, but then they turned to worshiping the Greek gods also. Greek influence started coming through, 
The next thing you know, they're worshiping this little fellow called Pan. Now you guys know who Pan is. Uh, in fact, a lot of influence into Peter Pan, uh, pandemic, that's a word we normally use now. It's all become part of our verbiage. And of course we have panic, pandemonium, all these other things that get started as a result of that word. The idea of pan uh, in, the, in the Greek culture, the, the pa, is the idea of all. Pantheism, God is in all things. Pantheism is uh, God and nature kind of combined together, which of course is false, it's not real. God created uh, nature, God created uh, the, uh, the creation around us. He is not part of creation, that's pantheism is what that is. And so as you stop and you think about that, uh, we had the opportunity as a group, and we do every year to go up, or every other year, to go up into that region and to check this place out. And it's a pretty fascinating place. Now, please bear with me. I've shared this with you before, not in this format, but in church. And um, I would share how we would go up to this place. We would hike up in a typical fashion. The pagans used to find these lush, beautiful areas to, uh, to, to build their fake false pagan temples as they were and of course that's what they did there a uh, huge cave huge little inlets where they would put their pagan shrines those types of things but in this particular cave once the Greeks got up there they switched over from Baal worship they went to pan worship and what they would say is the waters off Mount Hermon now Mount Hermon the highest point uh, in Israel uh, in fact it shares a border with Syria and Israel uh, they're skiing up there there's snow up there most of the year round by the way uh, they would, they, at the foothills of this is where this place is, Benias or Panias, uh, the, the, the area that we call Caesarea Philippi. And uh, what was interesting about it is you would go and you would look at that big cave structure and you can still see where they had some, some places where they would worship that type of a thing. Well, inside this cave, what would happen is the, the, the uh, snow and the rains up on Mount Hermon would wash down and the runoff and the thaw would eventually in, make its way up into this cave and the waters would start to come through. So in the springtime, when, when the snows would start to thaw out, uh, the water would come up through there, it would go through the cave system, and then it would become the headwaters for the Jordan River, which of course would head all the way down into the Dead Sea. A pretty long journey and uh, pretty fascinating as you watch it. But the interesting thing about this was, as the pagans would gather in this particular region, uh, the reason uh, that they thought Pan was uh, inhabiting this cave uh, was because when the waters would come down, they would bubble up. And of course, once they flowed out, they believed that the spirit of Pan flowed with that water and things would start to turn green. He would bring life to the region. Now, of course, you and I know it was water coming out of a cave and so forth. But there's no doubt that there was a spiritual connection to that place. And in fact, the people believed it so much, um, they, would, they would worship Pan at the entrance of this cave. Now you say, well, what's the big deal? Well, a couple of things. First of all, when the water would gush out and when it was starting to flow more and more, uh, when it would start particularly flowing out, it was pretty violent. And so people would say that the water was in a panic or it was pandemonium. In other words, they were attributing, it, attributing, attributing this to Pan, their God. And so uh, when you and I get into a panic and we get into a, um, to a, a real fervor over something, what we're doing is we're really, um, we're really paying tribute to paganism in a way. See, it's not, it's not good for you and I as a believer to panic over something, to get into pandemonium over something. You and I should be people that don't get to that point. Now, I'm not telling you not to be concerned about things, but I am telling you that we should not be people who panic. When we get concerned about something, what we're saying is that's a constructive word. Okay, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about the way that bridge looks. I'm concerned about what's going on here. I'm concerned about, that's okay to be concerned to be able to constructively do something. In fact, as long as we take it to the Lord, we follow what he says. Panic is unbridled. It's, we have no restraint and we just start to freak out. Well, you and I should not be those people who are freaking out. We shouldn't be in a panic. If you stop and you think, when you panic, you are, you are, you are in a way, in an essence, ascribing value to 
a foreign god is what you're doing. The second thing that happened in this particular region, in this place, Jesus took the disciples up there. Um, they made the 25-mile journey up north, and he taught them at that particular place, overlooking this area. Now, understand what was going on in this area. There was the worship of Pan and other foreign gods. And the way they worshiped these gods, I, in fact, I don't even want to go into it. It was so, it was so perverse. It was so corrupt. It was so bad that, that I really would have, I'll just say it was uh, a, probably the most immoral type things you can possibly imagine would go on in these places. Now, the people in Galilean region rarely would go up there because this was sort of like their red light district. They had prostitution, all kinds of things. So no good Jewish person would head up that way uh, because, you know, they were under the law and so forth. But Jesus takes his disciples because he's looking down the line and he's saying, hey, I'm going to use you lads to overturn this world and the system of this world. That's what I'm going to do. You're going to usher in you're going to usher in who I am, and you're going to let the world know the gospel. And so I need to take you there. And he takes them up there. And I believe he takes them up there to show them the contrast. Here's the pan. Here's the foreign gods. Here's the philosophies of the world. And here I am. And this is where Jesus once again asked the question that he asked earlier. Basically, who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John. Some say you're... But who do you say that I am? And, of course, Peter answers, and he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Ah, Peter, wonderful. You get it right. And what Jesus is doing, excuse me, and what Jesus is doing is he's saying, Do you guys see the difference here? Do you understand that those who follow me must recognize me for who I am? You must see me for who I am. But those, those who are still following the systems and the philosophies of this world, this is how they see things, and this is how they act. Jesus is drawing a comparison and a contrast in who he is and what the world system is all about. As we're going through this whole coronavirus situation, I see people who are call themselves religious or, or people of faith, and yet I see them exercising very little faith in who God is. Again, having concern about something is a lot different than falling into the panic of something. And I guess what I'm saying to you today is just that. You know, I, I believe uh, as we're slowly seeing the signs of coming out of this thing, I, I hope that we can all look back and say, you know, I trusted the Lord. Did I, did I follow what I was supposed to follow? I have people as a pastor who ask me all the time, you know, uh, why do you follow the government? Why shouldn't you just open your church and just let people come in and just trust God and all of it? Uh, because I don't have the... I don't want to disobey the government in something like that, number one. And number two, there is the reality of coronavirus, and people can get sick, and people who have compromised situations and so forth can get very sick. I don't want that on my shoulders. I wouldn't imagine you would want that on your shoulders. So I have concern over that, but I'm not panicked over it. Folks, what we need to do as believers today is stand up, be accountable before our Lord, but also figure out creatively, again, how can I show strength that the Lord has given, and how can I show the love that he's laid on my heart to go out and tell other people about the message of who he is? Listen, don't buy in to the hype that wants to panic you in this whole situation. If you're a believer, there's no reason you should be. That's like, that's like serving a foreign god. You want to understand that Jesus Christ is your rock. Wasn't it Jesus in that same, that same narrative where he commends Peter and he says, Peter, upon this rock, and I believe the rock he's talking about was one of two things. One, it was Peter's confession of Jesus Christ being Messiah and or Jesus Christ being the rock. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell. Final little thought. That whole area up there in, in Caesarea Philippi was known as the gates of hell. And Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Listen, guys, you and I have already been proclaimed and deemed victors. Whatever the world throws at us, whatever philosophy, whatever fear tactics will not overcome the church. It just can't do it. Jesus Christ has already proclaimed it that we're victors. 
So we need to start operating in that. So I want to commend you today, and I want to encourage you today. Stand up. Stand up. Take that armor, take that mentality, and don't allow yourself to be defeated by what this world and by what the philosophy, the fear monger in this world is Satan. You and I are not serving him. We're following our Lord. Victory is already ours. I hope that this real time spoke to you today, and I hope that you will encourage people to tune in to our real times so that they too can be encouraged in these times. So, hey, listen, our redemption draws nigh. Keep your head up.